Welcome. Welcome to First Thursdays with Sustainable Tulsa. We appreciate you all being here today. So you're here with First Thursdays. Uh, we meet every month here at TCC uh, C4C, which is the Center for Creativity. And um, each month we have a different guest speaker. So if you're new, uh, this is kind of uh, what happens, you, um, and if you want to pre-order lunch, if you wanted lunch and, it, and you didn't get lunch today, there's a way to pre-order, and you can visit Sabrina there in the back. She's waving, standing up there. If you have any questions about pre-ordering lunch for next time, we'd love to do that for you. Um, so thank you so much for being here. I want to give a thank you to PSO as the lead sponsor for First Thursdays, as well as give a thank you to Cavanta TCC Center for Creativity, and Mike McCann with McCann Law. So uh, wave your hand. Uh, where's I saw Mike. There's Mike. All right. And then, uh, so let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Also want to uh, give a thank you to my board members that are here today, uh, Mike Lemus and David Shelton. Uh, I appreciate their leadership and commitment to all that we're doing, so let's give them a round of applause. So just a, a couple quick announcements uh, today. Uh, we are wrapping up our scorecard program with the training that we're doing with our uh, new coaches. And then we'll be launching out the next year of the scorecard program. If you're interested in our triple bottom line strategy, the scorecard program, please uh, contact myself or Sabrina or even Mike Lemus here if you have any questions about if you're interested in being a coach or uh, being a part of the program. We verified 31 uh, companies this year, and they completed almost 900 items items uh, towards sustainability. And so we would be delighted to uh, get you engaged and be a part of that coming up. Um, so uh, let me know if you're interested in that. We have our next B2B case for sustainability series that's November 30th, and that'll be at OU Tulsa. The focus is innovation, and so we hope that you'll join us for that. We are going to offer booth space. Uh, it's the first time we've ever done that for um, a B2B case for sustainability series. We'll have an opportunity that you can uh, promote your sustainability efforts uh, and do a B2B opportunity there. So if you're interested, definitely contact Sabrina or I regarding that. Um, our next First Thursday, of course, will be here, and it will be on green gift giving and the idea of what are some ways to, to give during the holidays that would be considered greener. And we have Matt Carney, if you'll wave back there. He's with Root Tulsa. He'll be back next month uh, to talk to us about what they're doing with Root Tulsa and how to engage this season with getting together uh, with your family and friends as a way to give back uh, to each other. And we'll also have some other booth space uh, selling some local opportunities here uh, for gifts. So uh, please join us for that. And if you're interested and have something to sell, uh, definitely let us know about that. Um, this month, we have coffee. Usually it costs, but Rob with Chimera had to go, and so he said it's free. So uh, this month it's free, but we are trying to offer coffee uh, to bring back a little bit of that coffee feel uh, that we had over at Foolish Things. Um, so just letting you know that that is available. Um, and again, if you're interested in lunch, definitely pre-order with us. Um, we've added composting this time. Uh, we're working with Full Sun um, Composting. Natalie, give a wave there. She is running this new company here and offering composting. So if you work uh, somewhere that you want to offer composting in your workspace, she's your gal. So anyway, uh, so please compost your lunch and recycle the items there in the back. Uh, so, and also, uh, we're adding another element um, with our listening tables, and Cindy and Mike are helping to lead that. It's a new way to create more of an active process with First Thursdays, more engaging. So they will stick around afterwards to have a deeper conversation about what you heard today and, and maybe next steps for you or just interested in sharing those thoughts. So definitely join Mike and Cindy at the table over there for the listening sessions. I also wanted to welcome Secretary Teague of the Environment and Energy. Uh, thank you so much for being here and for your leadership uh, with Oklahoma. Uh, so thank you. Uh, we've got booths this time, and I'm going to ask Mike Lemus to the front to kind of introduce who is here, and also for him to talk about TCC being a Tree USA campus. So. 
Good afternoon, and thank you for being here. There's a real buzz in the room, and uh, that's exciting. Uh, we're all waiting with anticipation from our speaker, Mark Bays, who will be introduced in a moment by Corey. Uh, first, though, I want to let you know that uh, we do have a number of table exhibitors, um, including the uh, Conservation Coalition of Oklahoma. Uh, they, yeah, Ron, Ron and Phil, I had a little conversation with them. They're doing some real exciting things in Northeast Oklahoma, and you should go uh, chat with them. They um, are representing a number of different uh, 501c3s in the area. Um, next, the table that's, that's unpersoned at this point has a number of pamphlets, free, free of charge, I assume, uh, on taking care of your trees, provided by uh, Mark and company. Uh, next to that, um, we do have a table that's staffed by George Black, the uh, Director of Academic and Campus Services at the Metro Campus, also the coordinator for the tree campus effort at Metro Campus. And we are, Metro is one of four uh, campuses, all four campuses are Tree Campus USA. USA. It's an Arbor Day uh, funded project. And if you want more information um, about that, check with, check with George. He is, has all the facts. And next to George are the uh, group representing students, representing Phi Beta Lambda. They're a business group and they are uh, backing sustainable sustainability and sustainable concepts. And they are also um, you know, creating awareness of what they do, plus they are also uh, trying to do a little fundraiser today. Um, they are selling ornaments from Garden Diva. So if you are looking for that special ornament for your tree, they may have it for you. And um, I think that's it, right, Corey? Did I leave anybody out? Okay, so um, thank you, and uh, I'm looking forward to a great presentation, and I hope you are too. So I'll, I'll, let, Mar I'll let Corey introduce uh, Mark. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And maybe we'll hear a little more about how to become a Tree uh, USA uh, program. Uh, again, if you have any questions about some of the programs, I want to make sure that you've been introduced to Sabrina Bevan. She's back there. She's our new project coordinator. And um, I want to introduce our speaker today, which is Mark Bays. And thank you so much for being here. Uh, Mark uh, is a forestry graduate from Oklahoma State University, and, and he graduated in 1982. Bays works in traditional forestry in Colorado and California, and he's self-employed in Oklahoma and Texas as a consultant in urban and community forestry. He's been with the Oklahoma Forestry Service for the past 26 years, where he has been helping communities and individuals across the state appreciate the value, benefits, and services trees provide. He helps Oklahoma solve tough environmental issues through proper tree planting and maintenance programs. He administers grant programs that will provide funding to communities and nonprofits for tree planting, education, opportunities, and local program development. You can visit them on Facebook at Oklahoma Forestry. Let's give Mark a big round of applause. Thank you. Man, I'm tired. Do I do? <laughs> All that work, huh? Yeah. Well, thanks a lot for the invitation to come and talk trees with y'all. You know, trees, you can't not smile when you say trees. I mean, how great of a job do I have? I mean, that's just the coolest. So uh, thanks for inviting me over here to talk trees with y'all. <clears throat> Uh, I am a forester. I've been at it for quite some time, 1982. Holy crud. Uh, who knew? Um, but uh, uh, <clears throat> my love of trees has really started uh, in my youth. I was fortunate enough. I was talking to the secretary. Uh, my father also was in the Army, and so I got to travel around the world. I spent a lot of time in Germany and actually in the, the Black Forest. We got to see that. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, the Forest Meister is the keeper of the forest over there. And before I knew I really wanted to get into forestry, we used to sneak over into his garden, climb his trees, and pick all of his cherry trees. So I had a connection to forestry even before I knew that I wanted to, to be a forester. But I'm here to talk about Oklahoma's forests. And since I am with Oklahoma, I have to throw in y'all. So we're here to talk trees, y'all. And, uh, you know, if you think about forestry and, and all that, you might not be able to read this, but this is one of the reasons. You know, so maybe I should go into forestry instead of space. After all, there are billions and billions of stars, but not nearly enough good trees to take naps under. So, you know, how true is that? We need more trees to take naps under. I get to hang out with some pretty cool people. You know, we got a lot of people out there that are taking care of the forests, you know, including this guy. This is my hero. I talk to him all the time, make sure I'm doing things that are right. Uh, but we do have forests in Oklahoma, and I get an opportunity to talk about the forests in Oklahoma. 
Uh, and it's really interesting. You know, I tell people I'm from Oklahoma, and they go, what? You guys have trees in Oklahoma? Are you kidding me? I go, yeah, we got trees. We even have indoor plumbing and everything. You ought to come visit us sometime. And uh, it's just really a good thing. And matter of fact, what's really interesting is, uh, you know, we're actually having a national urban and community forestry conference in a couple of weeks. And I have to point out Steve Grantham in the back because it was much of Up With Trees lobbying that helped bring this national conference here. So thanks, Steve. It's a lot of work in the next couple of weeks, but. Uh, <clears throat> Talked about forest and green gifts. Uh, I am a forester, and I guess I'll go ahead, and when you came in, hopefully you put in one of your business cards when you first signed up, because I brought a whole forest of trees with me. There's five red buds and 10 loblolly pine trees that I guess uh, if you're uh, still awake at the end of my talk, uh, they'll draw a prize and your name's in there, and you'll, you can take a whole forest of trees home with you and everything. So that's my green gift. You know, that's what I'm giving you, talking green gifts. That's my green gift that I'll, that I'll give you all here. <clears throat> so forests in Oklahoma. Yes, we have forests in Oklahoma. And if you look at the top, you can kind of see along that whole green area there, that's the cross timbers forest. But if you look out towards the panhandle, out in there, we have a lot of our bottomland hardwood forests. And those are really the forests that we have that are along our major waterways, our creeks, and that sort of thing. Uh, you look up over to the northeast, that's our oak hickory forest that we have. It extends over into Arkansas, up into Missouri. Uh, if you haven't been down to the southeast part of the state, that's where we have a rich forest industry, and that's the pine hardwood forest. But what's really cool is the largest forest cover type that we have is this cross timbers forests. And some of it goes up into Kansas, and some of it actually does go into that state that's below us, but I'm forbidden by state statute to even mention. I can't even spell it. I don't know it. All I know is it ends in A-S and it should be another S, right? I, but I don't know, I won't say that. <laughs> um, but there's, in those forests of Oklahoma, we have 143 native trees that we have, and that's according to Dr. Elbert Little, who has uh, studied the forest extensively for a great amount of period. And there's 21 of those trees that as uh, the plains was settled uh, during European settlement, that we were bringing trees uh, from all across the country and planted. And so there's 21 introduced that have become naturalized. But we have a rich forest industry. Almost a third of our state, 28% of our state, is forested. It's one of the largest agriculture crops. I talked with Secretary Reese about this. No, it is the largest agriculture crop. You tell me a crop out there that's taller than a tree. You know, you got corn, but it doesn't come close. So anyway, it is a large agriculture crop. Uh, lots of weight, I mean, over $331 billion, or $4.5 billion total industry and, and, and 351 million in, in, uh, in wages. <clears throat> what about the environment, though? Those trees provide so much uh, to the environment and to the quality of life uh, throughout our whole state, in the natural areas and even in cities and towns. And uh, we'll get to the cities and towns in just a little bit. But what drives the forest cover that we have uh, throughout the state? Well, it's all about heat, and it's all about precipitation. And so Oklahoma. We have uh, one of the richest uh, plant communities. We're third in plant communities na nationally. Can you believe that? 176, I think, different plant communities in Oklahoma. And that's realistically just because, you know, you have the Panhandle, which is just under 5,000 feet. You have the southeast part of the state that's about 300 feet. You have, uh, you know, 15 inches of rain to 52 inches of rain. So that's a pretty diverse ecosystem that you have. And, and that's also what drives uh, the precipitation, I mean, that's what drives the, the forest cover type that you have. These are two graphs. The top one is precipitation and the bottom one is temperature. Over on the left side, that goes, that's about uh, the 1900s. Over to the right side of it, that's 2000, so 2005 and everything. <clears throat> so that just gives you, and, and the line in the middle of each of those, that's the average that we have in precipitation and temperature going back to the late 1900s. So just look at that for a little bit and you'll see some things. You've got the, the 20s or the 30s, you know, the Dust Bowl days where we were hotter and drier, the 50s. Some people, we don't even recognize that the 50s were another pretty extensive hot and dry period that we have. Uh, you know, so it was really dry and really hot for a decade. I've been out of school now for the 80s and, and, and look at that, look what we've had in Oklahoma. I mean, this is, this is kind of the challenge for us. I think one of the questions that we're posing is how can we prepare, you know, for the future 
uh, with this ongoing climate change that we're having here, <clears throat> whether it's believed or not. I mean, our planet's been here four and a half billion years. I promise you the climate today is a little bit different uh, than it was, you know, even, even a couple hundred million years ago when we had a fern forest down in the southwest part of the state. That's the hottest part of the state now, but you go down there and what do you find? You find petrified wood from an ancient forest. We have coal all across our state from an ancient forest. So anyway, so, so the climate is changing. That is happening. And we need to look at history to figure out how we can best position ourselves. I'm not going to say another 500 years, 600 years, but we need to best position ourselves today to address any of these climate issues that might be coming, and they will be coming. <clears throat> so here's what I like to ch challenge people in the green community too. Look, look at the precipitation since the 80s. We've been wet for a long period of time. We're due for a dry spell. So some of those marginal plants that we might have been getting by with, maybe they won't be around. Maybe we need to kind of rethink some of that stuff. Some of uh, the discussions that are having is, is if we're going to be going into a drier climate uh, with maybe the same amount of precipitation, but not the same number of precipitation events, but those events will be because with the warming climate, you have more water absorbed in the air before it gets dumped out and everything so your periods of that you're going to your timing for your precipitation is going to be changing in the future we need to start looking maybe to the southwest and more and more cities and towns are looking what's a little bit south and a little bit west some people are saying 150 miles look to see what their uh, native uh, tree covers is like and, and plant material and everything i know that the city of chicago was actually looking at what the heck's going on in oklahoma i mean that's a long way I mean, they're looking at what's going on in Oklahoma, what does well in Oklahoma that can best prepare them for whatever future is coming. So, did I go backwards on that? Oh, okay. So, 13 major ecoregions, 10 major uh, ecoregions, uh, and this is the Cross Timbers Forest. This is the coolest forest that we have in the state. It's the largest. Uh, the slide that you're seeing here, that kind of covers the whole cross timbers forest in the red shows the potential remnant forests that we still have. And what remnant forest is, is that forest that still may be there that is untouched or uncut. You know, the uh, European settlement, we cleared some of the land for uh, farming in our cities and towns and that sort of thing. But there's still some areas out there that are some remnant areas that we have these trees that uh, have been here for quite some time. Now, the forest that we have now. I won't go back the millions of years, but it's all evolved in the last 10,000 years, 12,000 years or so. And so there's this uh, bog that's down in Atoka County. It's called the Ferndale Bog, and it's in McGee Creek. And so they take pollen core samples out of this bog that's down there. And they can, they can look at the levels of pollen and the different pollens through time. It's much like, you know, you hear about everybody taking ice core samples and see how much air or carbon dioxide is in the, you know, the air up in the ice caps and everything. Same thing with this. So they found that about 12,000 years ago, uh, there were actually uh, spruce, white spruce in Atoka County. Those that you plant trees, up with trees, you plant spruce? No, you don't. <laughs> These are spruce trees that now are commonly found up in Canada, but they found some pollen of white spruce trees as far south as Atoka County. So that's when the ice sheet uh, started to come back. 97% of Canada was underneath like a mile of, of uh, ice. So that was cooler and wetter back then. So they found some of that. 10,000 years ago, it was more of an open space and prairie, a lot of grass pollen they were finding. 9,000 years ago, they started to see some oak uh, pollen in, in those. And then from 9,000 to about 5,400 years ago, they found very little pollen. So they theorized that that could be a time uh, for over 1,000 years, or maybe even thousands of years, that we have hot, dry climate really hit parts of Oklahoma. And so some areas of Oklahoma were even considered to even be a desert at that time, and, and that could be where you know, there's a the state park out west, the Sands Dune Park. So it could be that during that time is when that really started evolving. So about 5,400 years ago, they started seeing, well, there's oak savannas, more oak started to be coming around. And so our oak forests started forming around then. 2,100 years ago, they started seeing uh, some of the pine pollen showing up. And about 1,200 years ago, they started seeing hickory. So that's kind of the, the basics of, you know, our major forest cover that we've had through time. And uh, so that's what we have today. You know, we have this rich 
forest rolling hills uh, just all across the state. Uh, if, if I get elected governor, I will change the spelling to Oklahoma to O-A-K-L-A-H-O-M-A -A -A, because Oklahoma, that's our state, isn't it? Anyway, um, but in Oklahoma, I mean, there's like 450 different species of oaks uh, worldwide. There's about 60 in the continental United States. Uh, in Oklahoma, we have 26 different varieties of oaks, uh, and they're known by about 39 different common names. They're, they're pretty significant uh, in, in some of our history is because you here in Tulsa were founded underneath an oak tree, the Creek Council Oak. Uh, that uh, the, the story is that I've understood it, that uh, the, the, when the Creek Nation was moved here, they took the uh, coals from their fires from back in their traditional lands, and they uh, had a fire underneath this post oak tree just uh, over by the riverside and everything, kind of uh, claiming this area for them. So it's, just, it's right off of... I think 17th, 18th? 18th and Cheyenne is, is where it's at. Really just uh, really interesting. So post oak. So you also in the area here, remember that one slide with all the potential remnant places and everything? Over in Sand Springs, there's the ancient cross timbers forest that they have out there. And there's been some studies done out there by a fellow by the name of Dr. David Staley. He's a dendrochronologist from Fayetteville. And what that is is they just go out and they study you know, the age of trees by taking core samples, looking at them underneath a microscope, sometimes counting them. You can get an idea of, uh, you know, how old that tree is and, you know, the climate that was going on, the rainfall usually. Uh, wide rings usually means more rains, uh, rings tight together, maybe, you know, not as much rain during those periods. So he's a dendrochronologist. And so he's, you can be right next to one of these post oaks. And this is a post oak over there in the Cross Timbers Forest. Um, that's over 400 years old, and it's only 20 feet tall. So this idea when you're walking around even Turkey Mountain or some of these places and everything, and you're looking for the biggest giant in the woods, might not be the case. The, the reason why this tree was so stunted and old, and that's his dog, I can't remember his name. It's kind of an older slide right there, a little lab sitting at the base of it. But um, really rocky soils. So rocky soils, gnarly conditions for trees to grow in and everything. Uh, Bur Oak is another oak that we have. You guys have a history of that here, because why? Yeah, Tulsa's hanging tree. Who knew that you get, do you, do you guys familiar with the hanging tree in, in Tulsa? Well, the, the, the idea is, it's a, it's, it's a beautiful oak. It's a couple miles to, to the west here, over off of uh, 2nd Street, and it's underneath the billboard. You can see it from the highway there. But the idea is, in the early 1900s, they were uh, cattle rustlers were hung for this tree because when they were put in a sewer system, they found three skeletons. And, you know, and so it, it became the Tulsa's hanging tree in that sense, and to, to the point of American forests, you know, kind of believed in the legend that it used to be a tree that was provided in the famous and historic tree program that American Forest uh, did. They, they used to sponsor a program where all these historic trees with these significant events had, you know, that were happening around them kind of promoted that, you know, throughout uh, our country's evolution. Who recognizes this? What'd you say? Oh, favorite tree? Dun, 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 dun. You know, we can talk for the next six hours about this, and there's a lot of science on what's going on uh, about this, but this tree gets a bum rap. I mean, I'm a forester. This gets a bum rap. It's native in all counties except the panhandle. Did you hear me? It's native in all counties except the panhandle. Would you deny this girl a Christmas tree on the prairie? <laughs> you would deny this young child a Christmas tree if you don't like eastern red cedar. <clears throat> well, it does get a bum rap. This is what you see. It spontaneously combusts, you know, for no apparent reason. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, then you look at some of this. Okay, look at this house in the foreground. That thing was burnt toast. And if you look in the background, eastern red cedars. Huh, they didn't spontaneously combust. They, they were still around. Now... This is Dr. David Staley doing research. Eastern red cedar, I said, is you know, native in all 77 counties. How old is this one? Some of you might have known. Do I hear five, do I hear four, 45, 45, 45, over 600 years old, right in Sand Springs. So do the math on that. Some dude sailed the ocean blue in 1492. You know, that was 520-something uh, years ago. So this tree was alive 
in Sand Springs when Christopher Columbus set foot on this continent. Now, the whole science of what's going on is that this whole cross timbers forest, also, we started seeing charcoal on the, on the growth of trees. When David Staley would go in and core these trees out, you could see that <clears throat> our whole cycle, there was a fire regime. Some of it was by the early Indians, some of it was lightning strikes and everything. So much of our forested uh, cover that we have in Oklahoma was through a succession of fire. And what fire did is that's the easiest way to control eastern red cedar, because it burns across the prairie, and then it burns out in those lower areas, and that's where you used to find the eastern red cedar. Now, fire is not on the prairie as widespread as it used to be, and so what's happening? You know, they're moving out. They're, they've always been able to do it, but it's a land management issue. It's not a tree issue. And so to demonize, you know, a, a native tree, I think we're doing a disservice. We're, we have to look at the management of our state and how we could best uh, apply, you know, the things that we know about the science and, and the trees that are here that have always been here before us and everything. And then we need to use this to move forward. Okay, I'll get off my pedestal on, on the Eastern Red Cedar. I am a friend of the Eastern Red Cedar. Lorix asked me to. Cottonwood, that's one of the trees that are in all 77 counties. How cool is cottonwood? It's our biggest tree that we have. You know, it's almost 10 foot in diameter. How can you not like a cottonwood tree? Oh, I know, all the cottony stuff that it throws out for a couple of weeks out of the year. Those are the female trees that do that. <laughs> not the men trees, that's all I'm saying. It's the females that are doing that, but uh, <clears throat> no, and so what, what, I, what I laugh at is when people say, oh, hey, well, you know, I'm, I'm allergic to cottonwood because I'm sneezing. Well, you might be allergic to cottonwood, but those little cottony things, that's not the pollen. That's the, the seed being carried through and everything. So if you're sneezing during a time that, you know, you're seeing the cottonwood fly out, you're really allergic to something else. Uh, we have two species of cottonwood. We have the plains cottonwood and we have the eastern cottonwood. So that's really cool. Who knew there were two kinds of cottonwood trees? So the plains cottonwood are a little bit further uh, you know, out on the prairie, out towards the west. They're really a significant tree if you think about trees in Oklahoma because before air conditioning, they used to have 4th of July celebrations underneath the, the crown spread of the cottonwood tree. When, when they were crossing the prairie, uh, you would see these large trees in the, in, the, in the background and that was usually a place where you could see water. And so there was an indicator that if you needed water, look for the cottonwood trees because a lot of them grow around the water. Uh, getting hitched in Oklahoma. There's this tree that's called the Marion tree. It's on Highway 81, uh, just on the Garfield and Kingfisher County Road. And back a long time ago, used to be that when you were married in one county, you would only be recognized as being married in that one county. So I don't know when it changed, but so what they did was they, this tree was right on the county. So they would go up, people would get married. Then they would go across to the next county on the other side of the tree, get married again. So at least they were recognized in two different counties in Oklahoma. And it was a really great place to do it because it was under the shade of a cottonwood tree. Now, I was asked, Sabrina asked me about uh, monarchs and butterflies and sustainability and all that. Uh, you know, the monarchs, they just recently migrated. I don't know if you knew that or not. September, October-ish, it's really cool to just, you know, just to see the monarchs, just all, all, all that they go. And so for trees in Oklahoma, really the significance for trees in Oklahoma and the monarch migration is because it gives them resting places when they travel south. Uh, they don't really eat a lot, although I had a vitex tree in my backyard. I live in Oklahoma City, and it was really neat. I always come out at night because uh, you could see them. Monarchs would come into my backyard and they would just look for a place and one of them was feeding on a vitex tree. And so <clears throat> they have several generations a year, but this last generation, they're the ones that make that migration all the way down to Mexico. I mean, it's an amazing thing to do. So they, they do like cedar trees, uh, they like fir trees, and they like trees with canopy because they're very protected when they over, went overnight in their, in their trek south. And so they're protected, there's high, higher humidity in those areas. And so that's what trees provide us. Uh, the, you know, the monarch migration is uh, really a resting place uh, when they travel south. And this is just some pictures of, of some uh, monarchs. I used to have a black willow in my backyard and a number of years ago, I, I, they would look just like this right there on, on the upper left, right there. They, they just get on that whole thing down there and it's just like a whole little branch of monarchs. It's just the coolest thing to see. So that's what uh, forests pr uh, provide. So now we're getting closer to the city. Where's where the people going? You know, uh, most of the people live, uh, I'd say 80% of the people in Oklahoma are in a city or town. And this is what cracks me up. You know, suburbia, they tear out the streets, and then, you know, they tear out the trees and they name the streets after them. You know, this is Oak Holler Road. I go, well, let's holler because where all the oaks go on this thing? You know, so 
But they are starting to get much better because when you think about the value lost from losing that green space and that green cover, I mean, it's much more than just losing trees. In our urban areas, we have land development issues, and that's just the fact of time. You know, you can infill, you can outfill. There is development with a growing population. Oklahoma's population isn't growing as fast as, you know, like the country or the world, but we do have a growing population, so we are occupying more space, and we just have to be a little smarter when it comes about how we manage the growth of our cities and towns with our population growth. So there's some studies that have been happening through time, and if you retain trees in development, uh, there are just some numbers here that come up that they do increase value. These studies have been done both with real estate companies and people by the name of Dr. Kathy Wolf. But so, you know, it, building lots with substantial mature tree, uh, mature, tree, mature tree cover, easy for me to say, 18% um, higher, you know. 22% tree covered undeveloped acreage, a higher value. So that wooded lot always cracks me up. I'm gonna buy this lot, this wooded lot, because it's really, you know, it's got a higher value, and then I'm gonna cut them down and build something there. Doesn't make sense, you know? So because those mature trees on that lot, you need to work with nature rather than against nature. So lots bordering suburban wooded areas, you know, 19 to 35% open land, two thirds wooded, it's just a lot. So there, there are some studies, and we're starting to realize this, and builders and developers are starting to figure this stuff out too, that people love these natural settings. There are these quiet places in our cities and towns that we can make it through, you know, the, our busy schedules. But we need to understand that people look at trees differently. You know, you've got the planner, you've got the parks department. You know, oh, it's a bunch of work because now we're going to have to rake all the leaves. You've got the publisher, you've got the highway department, uh, developer, and, and I don't know what the landscape architect thinks about that. But, you know, people view things differently. Now, this is Dennis, and even poor Dennis, he goes, they make baseball bats out of that? It's an aluminum tree? You know, so uh, Dennis didn't quite get it either. <clears throat> and they made me making that because ash is a tree that uh, we're losing a lot, emerald ash borer, and that's what baseball bats are made of, so maybe they will become aluminum bats. But anyway, uh, so which one are you? Do you complain that rose bushes have thorns, or do you rejoice in the fact that a thorn bush has roses, you know, has flowers? So we just need to understand that. So write this down www.naturewithin.info. Some of these slides that I'm going to be taking information from is from uh, Dr. Kathy Wolf, and she has done a tremendous amount of work when it comes to the social values, when it comes to environmental benefits, and um, so if you pull that up, I mean, that's, that's it. You can take a picture of that, same thing. So she really does, she studies a lot about the human value uh, of, of community forestry and urban greening, and just a tremendous amount of studies. <clears throat> And it's really called green infrastructure. You know, you got the gray infrastructure, but green infrastructure is connecting, you know, the, the, the green spots with corridors of green, uh, you know, for not only, you know, the benefits to wildlife, but for the human health and the human spirit as well. So there are lots of values and benefits of urban trees. Easy thing, taking carbon dioxide, spit out oxygen. They reduce stormwater runoff. Uh, soil stabilization, they reduced energy costs uh, strategically planted around your home. Uh, they can reduce the energy costs from heating in the summer, shade trees on the south and west side, evergreen on the north and west, wait, south and west, yeah, and an evergreen on the north and west side shields it from the wind coming in from uh, the, the, the winter. So reduce energy, quality of living, real estate records, reduce crime. Huh, really? Are you sure about that? Yes, there are studies that show that uh, inner city public housing areas that have green space and open space where people can come out and visit and get to know their neighbors and everything, there is less domestic violence and crime in those public housing areas than just the ones that are in the gray buildings and the streets and that sort of thing. Interesting studies, lots of it in, from Chicago. Improved learning, I'm gonna talk about that in a second. Improved job performances, huh? Yeah, it actually is something to that. So iTree uh, is something, this is another one, uh, just do a search for iTree. Uh, and it's something, uh, it, it's this new technology that can use, go out and, and identify and, and, and put a value on the tree that's in your front yard. You can, your, your, your tree in your front yard has value. And in this iTree Suites, it's free. You can just uh, do a search for it and go online. And in iTree Design, you can click on iTree Design. You can put the address of your house. Scary, but your house will come up. Uh, and then you can determine the value of the trees, the environmental services that your trees are providing you in that. 
And all this, we were talking about this earlier with the energy secretary. This is all done through you know, the latest research and value of trees. And you know, big trees give you more value, and the smaller trees give you, you know, smaller value of environmental benefits and everything. So great, great stores to go to. And you can even figure out this, through the life of that tree how much environmental services and value that tree will provide you throughout the whole life. Really cool stuff. So yeah, you're right, uh, improving air quality. Uh, trees do that, but how about parked cars in a shaded parking lot? They produce less surface level ozone. Huh. We don't think about stuff like that. So shading our parking lots, you know, that's why they tell you during these ozone alert days, you know, fill up after dark because uh, you, you want to minimize that surface level ozone. Well, you park cars under shade trees and they produce less of that surface level ozone. All right, you could choose. Who likes this? Good. Nobody gets to get kicked out. Who wants that? Yay. <laughs> I talk to public works department and everything all the time, and I go, why do you do that? And well, it's because the, you know, because the hydrology of what's going on in that particular place in the city, you know, we had to do it that way. You've got to straighten it out. You've got to put concrete on it. It's pretty costly, but it's the only solution for you know, whatever was going on in that part of the city at the time. And I say, no, it's not then why is it that in that very same park, I took both these pictures? I took one facing this way, took one facing this way. So if you can have one, why would you do the other? You know, makes no sense. And it doesn't matter. Nature is going to win. You know, why fight nature? You put these things up here, and what happened? It tries to reclaim its property that you stole from it. You know? So, so there, there are... Okay, so, so the tree canopy in, in rainfall, it, it does it through a number of different ways. I'm not going to bore you with all these numbers and everything, but this is, <clears throat> this is how I understand it. <clears throat> so, big tree, rainfall retention. A little bit of water falls through, you know, it just, it, it's held up in the canopy of the tree. So, peak storm water runoff is reduced because of that. <clears throat> After it reaches that point, it flows down the stem. Flowing down the stem, it gets to the roots. Gets to the roots, gets into the soil. After all that happens, you know, if you stand under a tree long enough in a heavy rain, you'll start getting wet. So you have some through fall down there. Then it'll start to filter, filter in and percolate throughout the soil. So that's one of the great things that trees can do. Slows the process, keeps that water in place. Then the natural part is it transpires out. So it's that whole hydrological cycle that, you know, more trees, you know, the, the more that you have, they can actually help reduce this peak stormwater runoff and, and actually in, increase the, uh, uh, you know, or improve the, the water quality as well. <clears throat> so this is, people, people in cities believe this so much. This is the city of Fayetteville. Uh, this is a gully stream park that they did. And you see a lot of these little channelized things. So what are you going to do? Let's just fill it with concrete and go. No. <clears throat> they decided to, uh, no riprap, no nothing. They uh, actually sheltered out, smoothed the banks out a little bit so they're not just that rig rigid bank. They put rock structure in the center there that you can see, rock clusters to help divert the stream flow away from the banks of the tree so you don't have that, er or the, the, uh, away from the banks of the streams where you don't have that erosion. They came back and used uh, volunteers to plant uh, native trees back there and everything. And here's, you can see this picture where those rocks are starting to keep the erosion away from the bank around the side. Uh, and this is a little bit uh, more of a ca case. You can just see that. And, and that's what it looks like now, several years after that. So again, which one do you want? I mean, if it's possible to solve the flooding issues, why not do that? There's other ways to, uh, to do this, and, and that's green roofs. I mean, that, that's a, what a great way to capture uh, water. And this is Missouri. Uh, one of them's in Indiana. The other one's another green roof. But, you know, this is not rocket science. I mean, it's amazing to me. Oh, the, the latest invention, green roofs. Let's, let's do that. No, we invented it in Oklahoma. <laughs> We've been doing green roofs since the Dust Bowl days. You know, we did, uh, with sod roofs with sod. We did it. <clears throat> so there are some going on in Oklahoma City. There are some maintenance. I get it. You know, so you just can't put it up. You've got to maintain it somehow. Who knows where this is? Mike, you know where this is. Look up. It's on the top of this building. How cool is that? Got a green roof right on this building. 
Uh, this is another one. This is the Warren Clinic, Natalie Building here, here in Oklahoma City. I know that the, or, or, in Tulsa, and the zoo has a green roof, and, and there's a lot of different green roofs out there. And that's a great way to help uh, not only uh, mitigate the stormwater runoff, but it adds insulation, and, and so it really helps the building when it's constructed correctly. Her, urban heat island effect, uh, you hear a lot about that. There's so much buildings and so much asphalt impervious surface. It elevates the temperature as much as 15 degrees. Uh, you know, th then the surrounding area, shade is a good thing, you know. I didn't stage this. I mean, this, this one guy in the middle of this parking lot found this one tree to park his truck underneath. To put it where the cars are. Don't put it around it. You know, it's not like offensive trees. You've got to put the trees out in the area where, you know, the cars are parking. Ooh. Yeah. There's a ninja sound here. <laughs> So these are just some examples of different style of parkings, you know, to encourage more of those benefits of trees in open space. In the lower uh, left here, that's actually pervious material that you can create that allows water to go in rather than being washed off. It's amazing to see these things in action. When it's actually raining, you can see the runoff of a, off of an asphalt, but then you're standing right there and, <clears throat> excuse me, it looks like, where's the water going? It's just going into the soil where it's supposed to. You gotta give them room to grow. You know, come on now. Uh, that's a lace bark elm. <laughs> Uh, it's going to cause some problems. So this is a good thing. You know, you have Utica Square here, downtown retail. Uh, you know, the, the shoppers will linger longer and expect to spend more money in those areas. And, and these are some of the studies that uh, Kathy Wolf has come up with. Community forests are all the way into the local uh, area in your neighborhood. Some of the studies that are done as far as green cities, so mature trees greater than nine inches can increase the property value by 2%. You know, larger trees uh, increases that are a little bit farther away, 3%. Three, 3%. Trees in the front yard, landscaping can add three to 5%, you know, good tree cover in a neighborhood. You know, that same neighborhood with and without trees, you better believe the ones with the trees have a higher retail value. And mature trees and high income neighbors can actually, in high neighborhoods can actually increase the, the property value by as much as 15%. So all that means is trees add value no matter where they're at. I mentioned trees and crime. Uh, some of the studies in Chicago, uh, some of these studies are in Philadelphia. Uh, they just looked at uh, these open space areas that they're cleaned up, again, creating this neighborhood type atmosphere where people could come out and, uh, you know, get to know their neighbors in open space. Uh, there is less crime in those areas. <clears throat> but there are some things, you know, the, the smaller trees you hear, well, the boogeyman's hiding around those small trees, you know, and, and so, so the, the thing is you want to plant the trees that grow up and so the canopy's not all the way to the ground. So there are some perceptions like that that you have to deal with to address these you know, these human fears that we have around trees. Schools and learning. I called it daydreaming when I was in school. I got hit so much for looking out the window, but little did I know that I was improving my learning capacity. <clears throat> because they even show, this is more of that Kathy Wolf studies that she does, you know, cafeteria room views with trees and shrubs improves students' performance on standardized test scores. Graduation rates are higher percentage of students going to a four-year career, and there's a little bit less criminal behavior in, in our schools and everything. So again, that's just an amazing thing to think about. <clears throat> okay, this is our evolution. Isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth? We're hunched over that dang, you know, laptop, that computer and everything. Well, guess what? There's this attention restoration theory. I mean, everything's a theory or a syndrome or something like that. Uh, but in a, in a cubicle office, you know, you've got all this, you know, how sad is it to only find the, you know, the toilet to find your own little space there and everything, and you've got the aggression and everything. Well, they did find also with workplace views that desk workers without a view of nature reported 23% more ailments in, in like the six months prior to this. Uh, less satisfaction or the ones that were satisfaction, they were less fr frustrated and they were more patient when they had areas of green space to view and a higher overall job performance uh, in place as well. But the idea is, and, and the, some of the other parts of that study show is that there's less sick days uh, that are, uh, people are, you know, perform better and there's just less, less sick days if you've got this place to interact with nature. But uh, what the idea is, is for that moment that you, that, you know, your boss might say, hey, quit daydreaming, but I'm looking out over at this tree, 
uh, and I'm just seeing the wind blow in the breeze, and you know, if there's some water, I'm just seeing the beautiful colors on the maple trees here. That is effortless, uh, effortless attention that it just takes me away from what I'm doing at my desk for a second or two. And that restores my attention and my ability to, to function at a higher capacity there. So that's what they're talking about. Even studies where hospital patients uh, have a view of nature or an open space to go out, they recover quicker with less, less medication. This is amazing. We don't need a pill. Let's look at nature. This is my cubicle. This is my wish cubicle. No, that's not. I do have one of the little cubicles, and I'm hunched over every time like that. But returning to the forest and the power of trees and human health and human healing is so powerful that uh, there are doctors that are now prescribing walks in the forest. Imagine that, going to the doctor. Hey, just, you got high stress, you got tension, go for a walk in the forest. You'll feel better. You mean there's no pill for that? What are you talking about? No, they are starting prescribing this. Uh, lower blood pressure simply by taking a walk in the forest in a park or something like that. Amazing stuff. Now, they're not talking about this when they're talking about, you know, walking and you're taking a walk in the park with your dog and everything. Um, I think this is what they mean. So, uh, yeah, just get out and enjoy the park. Find your peace of mind. Uh, parks and open spaces, more of those just numbers. They don't really mean anything except, you know, anywhere near parks, uh, there's a higher dollar amount uh, that's kind of associated with that. There's a lot of that going on in Oklahoma City. Uh, right now with our park development is we, we have this uh, core to shore park that we're developing and this is our scissor tail we're calling this scissor tail park and this is 60 acres or something like that that we have uh, and we're creating it in, in an area that used to just be highly urbanized and everything so I'm really proud about that I know you guys have this you know you've got the gathering place you know, <laughs> and it's along the river and everything but but I think that's really cool that two of the largest city park development projects are going on right here in Oklahoma. I mean, how cool is that? That's just great for a state that everybody believes is a, pra a prairie. So uh, close to the end here, I just put this slide in here in case you missed it earlier, itreestool.org. You just go on there and uh, look for that. Uh, don't listen to me. You know, I, I talk to different people and everything, and uh, here's, here's, forget about everything that I said. This is a little YouTube video, and we'll see how it works. Now we're really testing. Hit play. Do you find yourself longing for the apocalypse? I did. I was looking for a reason to live. Hi. Are you feeling tired, irritable, stressed out? Well, you might consider nature. From the people that brought you getting outside comes prescription strength nature, a non-harmful medication shown to relieve the crippling symptoms of modern life. Nature is recommended for humans of all ages and it's great for pets too. Nature can reduce cynicism, meaninglessness, anal retentiveness, and murderous rage. In clinical studies, nature is proven to decrease... Oh, come on, come on, don't, don't, don't lose it. Don't lose it. You had me there. Buffering, buffering. Mike, did you pay your internet bill here at the place here? No. These <laughs> work induced catatonia. Caution. Nature may cause you to slow down, quit your job, or seriously consider what the f you're doing with your life. If you are overly cynical, jaded, or emotionally numb, you may need to increase your dose of nature. Do you have trouble being even mildly uncomfortable? Nature may not be right for you. Side effects may include spontaneous euphoria, taking yourself less seriously, and being in a good mood for no apparent reason. So ask your doctor if nature is right for you. I'm ready for it. <laughs> yeah, so I, I could have done this next talk in just like two seconds like that. Anyway, the other part, and, and the last part, is is, is I don't want an award in 10 years. You know, we were talking about what the future holds and things like that. Uh, we need to plan for 40 years. We need to plan for 60 years. That's when I want the award. The stuff I do today, I want the person that takes over after me to come back and say, man, that person knew what the heck he was doing. We don't have much to fix because I've spent a lot of my career fixing some of the stuff that came before me. So, so in our tree planting, in, in our development, we just not only think about what's going on today, we need to plan for what's going on in the future. 
That's all I have. So, thanks. <laughs> now, do we, do, we, do we take questions or? I will say one thing too. You said that, what's the cost of nature? What's the cost of visiting our forest? Wasn't it you that were saying that you were coming over today? They're having this idea that um, at the national level, what is, an, what is an acceptable fee to visit our parks? You know, and, and we're actually talking about it here in Oklahoma too. You know, with reduced budgets for whatever reason and everything, if we are keeping these areas open, what's an associated cost that the public is willing to give? I know one side is, what are, what are all those pe people doing anyway? Aren't we paying, you know, salary people to do that kind of stuff? And yes and no, you know, there, there's some of that discussion that you can have too, but actually the cost of managing and maintaining, remember what I said about Eastern Red Cedar? Part of the reason why that's spread into areas that we haven't traditionally seen it is this, this epic. And one, I think one of the questions here is, what do we, what about, how can we in, engage, you know, the, the private uh, ownership of the land to think about the bigger picture? And I think that's part of one of the reasons why Eastern Red Cedar is spreading so fast is because 90% of our, our, our land in Oklahoma is, is owned by private people. And you might do what you can to mitigate your trees and manage your property as best, but if your neighbor doesn't do it and your neighbor doesn't do it, then uh, you know we're still going to be in that same picture. But one of the questions is, is how much is, um, so I'm going to ask you this. I mean, right now all of our state parks are free. Some of the discussion is maybe we need to charge that. So who would be willing to pay a state fee? I don't even know what that is, to visit our state parks. Okay, that's, that's fair. I'm sorry? Well, it depends, yeah, 20 bucks, no. <laughs> I don't know, so, so yeah, so we, we value that. And, and these are the kind of conversations that they're having right now, is what's a fair value on that? So if, if there is a value, what's gonna change? That's my question, is when I, when I visit state parks and national parks, and the reason why a lot of our uh, national parks are having all these catastrophic fires is that you know we traditionally haven't been allowed to manage the land. You know, we have, as foresters, been prevented from actively managing the land, and sometimes that means you need to go in and do some thinning and some crop, you know, harvesting and that sort of thing. But we haven't really done a good enough job of that, <coughs> excuse me, of, of actively managing some of our properties. So, so one of my questions would be is, you know, how, yeah, I, I'm willing to pay whatever. How is that going to change? How is that going to better the situation that we have now to minimize, you know, uh, negative problems that might be happening in the future? So... So you just asked, I, I commented on that, so. Um. You can take one or two questions, so if you have questions. Yes, ma'am. How can we encourage people to do more native species because, like crepe myrtles right now are in great danger because of a scale disease, and we're going to lose a lot of them, and they're not pollinator friendly, but the nurseries sell the oriental trees and non-natives, so right. how can we move more back to the native? Define what period in time. If I was given to this talk 350 million years ago, would I even bring up cottonwood? You know, so I'm sorry, I just had to say that. But uh, some, you know, so at what period in time? I'm serious about that because the natives that have evolved for the last 10,000 years, remember I said there was white spruce in Atoka? We need to think about our native trees that are more adapted to drought conditions, maybe those prolonged periods of intermittent, you know, rainfall that came down. And so I think we need to define what we mean by native because the natural lands as this, you know, climate continue, it's, it, we have a variable climate. You can call it climate global warming, you can call it climate change, but we have climate variability in this state or in this country, in this world. And so the plants are going to react to that. So natives are good, uh, but maybe the natives in, in uh, Tulsa County, maybe they might be in Muskogee County that we need to think about planting. There are some nurseries that are doing a, a good job of promoting more of the natives uh, because they do ha are less likely to have uh, you know, some problems with insects and diseases and that sort of thing. I mentioned emerald ash borer. Well, that's, that's a non-native insect that came in through shipping up in uh, around Chicago area that it's wiping out all of our native uh, ash trees and everything. So, so go down to the garden center and ask for them. Uh, I, I can't really plug too many nurseries, but I know you have some, I don't know enough of them around here in Oklahoma or in, in Tulsa that, that has, has some of these native type species and everything, but I think it comes from the consumer. 
Uh, you know, I, I've had discussions with a lot of the largest growers and some of the smallest growers, and some of the smallest growers get it. Uh, you know, I'll mention Sunshine Nursery in Clinton. Um, he goes out and collects his seeds from tough, durable trees, you know, that are suitable for Western Oklahoma. And so he has a high success rate with some of those species and everything. Some of the larger companies are starting to do it. Some of the seed collection uh, com major companies, you know, they, they collect seed, you know, Schumard Oak, you can find it all over the country and everything. And so, but the Schumard Oak that grows up north might not grow here. So some of the major seed collecting companies are now starting to think more about regionalizing their seed bank source. They're not there yet, and there's more improvement of that. And I, I think that, you know, we, we just need to promote it and, and push them in that direction. You know, because we're zone, probably, what are you guys, six, seven here? Seven, about seven A, something like that. You know, you can find this all the way into North Carolina. I promise you the North Carolina zone 7A is a lot different than ours because, you know, you sneeze and it will, it'll be 100 degrees here and then it'll be 30 the next day. So I think just, you know, just look for those, uh, those companies that are willing to push the buttons and, and get some of the bigger companies to do it. Well, let's give Mark a round of applause. Yeah, thank Thanks. Well, I, so, I, you know, I asked Mark if he would touch on people, profit, and planet, and I, you beautifully did touch on the quality of uh, how our forests do impact sustainability. So I really appreciate all the information, and I hope you all walked away with some information that you could carry on to your workplace or home. And uh, so thank you so much. And you brought a force for someone. So uh, why don't you uh, see who is walking home with this? Uh, no. <laughs> For the forest, huh? Okay. How much is it worth? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, let's see. Oh, okay. Deborah Perry, you're going home with some trees. Woo! All right. Come on down. Thank you so much. Thank you again. Stick around and visit a little bit more. There's uh, definitely booths to go by and visit. And we'll, we'll see you next month. Thank you so much.